what exactly goes into finding and exploiting a zero-day vulnerability. Today, we're going to take a look into the process used to find one such vulnerability in a piece of software called PDF Crack, and how we found and exploited a zero-day vulnerability in it. So, what is PDF Crack? PDF Crack is a piece of software written to brute force encrypted PDF files. There's several different features, but what was important for its selection as our first target software for these streams was that it was written in C with no real dependencies, and it parses a complex file format. As the first in this series of vulnerability discovery streams, I wanted our choice to be something relatively easy to use AFL with. In total, we spent about 8 hours on stream looking at PDF crack, which was 95% of the total time I spent looking at the target. This was over the course of 4 weeks, so I got the advantage of having a little bit more time to do free thinking about what was going on in the application, rather than if I had just looked at it for 8 hours straight. And note that one piece that is missing from this time is the initial attack surface analysis conducted. Prior to selecting PDF Crack as a target to stream, I did some preliminary analysis to verify that it would be a reasonable target for AFL. Part 1. AFL Setup and Fuzzing Ignoring the more exotic methods for getting AFL instrumentation, we went with the straightforward method of compiling the PDF Crack application with instrumentation. Luckily, this was quite straightforward. All we needed to do was add a source repo to our aptitude sources, run apt-get source PDF Crack, which pulls down buildable source code for the application, set the makefile to use afl-gcc, the GCC-compatible AFL compiler, and run make. Once we were done with this process, we had to create a handful of initial inputs for AFL to use as seed files. This was a little bit tricky, since we did it the wrong way on stream. Due to how AFL works, we need an input that will relatively quickly cause the program to end execution. But the way that PDF crack works, it will continue trying to brute force a password, if one is necessary, until one is found. On stream, we got around this by setting a simple password and being quick with our control C to break in and create a state file. But for this video, we used a slightly different process. Using GDB, we set a breakpoint on the start of brute forcing, and then used an input PDF that is encrypted but with a blank password. When we run PDF crack, we will then immediately break in, then send a control C or sig interrupt signal to the application, causing it to save a state for us. Regardless of how our inputs were created, once we had an input set, it was a simple matter of letting AFL chug along for a while and create a collection of crashes for us to dig through. Part 2. Crash Analysis After letting AFL run for about a week against PDF crack, we ended up finding about 220 crashes, although those are not necessarily what we would consider unique. And since we're lazy hackers, sticking through over 200 crash dumps is not my idea of a fun time, so we threw together a simple method for doing crash triaging. First and foremost, we set up ASAN, the address sanitizer plugin for the Clang compiler, and used that to rerun all of our input files through PDF crack once again, capturing the output of that. This second run was important. Looking through the initial crashes, it was readily apparent that many of them were related to heap corruption, and unfortunately for us, the point of corruption in the final crash can be significantly different in execution. More importantly, it makes it very difficult to determine if two crashes are unique. A single heap buffer overflow could corrupt the state of a program, causing it to crash in numerous different ways, potentially significantly farther in the application's processing chain than when the corruption actually occurred. To remedy this, we used ASAN to immediately trigger upon any out-of-bounds reads and writes of a buffer, including those heap buffers. Once this was taken care of and we had a new log of crash information, we went through a much reduced list manually, figuring out which of the crashes were actually unique and which may be an out-of-bounds write. Eventually, we found a classic heap buffer overflow if a dictionary file is specified. Part 3. Heap Grooming Once we had a potentially exploitable vulnerability, it was time to go about trying to actually exploit it. However, in order to do that, we had to throw away the premise that this was going to be a particularly security-relevant vulnerability. The buffer we were overflowing ended up being the last buffer to be allocated as part of the initialization process, and in our testing, I found that there were no more allocations being made after it. While we could overflow into other objects in the heap, it wasn't going to be particularly useful if there was nothing else after us on the heap. In order to do this, we made some changes to the command line arguments being passed into the application. Certain parameters control allocations, and in particular, passing in the dash "-l parameter multiple times would cause an allocation and a free. This was important because it allowed for a freed block to exist at the very start of the heap. This way, we could cause our dictionary heap buffer overflow to lie at the start of the heap, allowing us to overflow any of the other objects allocated. Part 4. Throwing everything away and starting over. As sometimes happens when doing exploitation, 
After spending a good three to four hours trying to land our heap overflow vulnerability, we found something new that was much easier to land. It turns out, while we were looking at objects in that program state object we could overflow into, there was a simple, straightforward stack buffer overflow we could export instead. Instead of heap grooming and mucking around with allocations, we were instead able to just write 256 bytes into a 32-byte buffer on the stack. Once we found the second vulnerability, we threw away the first and jumped right into exploiting this easier one. Part 5 exploiting a stack buffer overflow. With our new stack buffer overflow, it became a simple matter of creating a wrap chain to get us some sort of useful effect. In the case of this stream, I leaned on a lot of the CTF experience, and we just popped a local shell to demonstrate vulnerability. In our case, we used the wrapper application at a recommendation from one of the stream viewers to help find some useful gadgets, and then we pieced together a simple wrap chain to modify entries and got. Final exploit details. Let's take a look at exactly what is going on in our exploit. If we take a look at the state file format, we see that there is a field called file ID, which is used for storing some sort of identifier. There's a length field attached to it, which is validated to be less than or equal to 256. It then gets copied into a buffer, which only has space for 32 bytes for it. After that, it's pretty simple. We need a valid state format, and the file ID field is parsed as pairs of hex characters separated by spaces. If all the file validates, we'll initialize our brute force state, return from the function, and jump right into our rupture. This all raises an important question. If this vulnerability was so simple, why didn't AFL find it when we were fuzzing? We ran AFL for a week and got quite a few crashes, and even though this was one of the areas that was manipulated in some of our test cases, this particular vulnerability was never triggered. Why not? Well, it comes down to what AFL is and is not good at. If we dig a little bit deeper into how the file ID field is parsed, we see that while the checks are being conducted are clearly wrong, we're checking that we are within 256 bytes and then copying into a 32-byte buffer, it does validate that our length field is exactly equal to the number of hex pairs we parse out of the state file. If we put in, say, a length of 256 bytes, but only put in 50 pairs, we will fail that validation pass and never get to our overflow. Even with ASAN turned on, we weren't able to find it. When we initially read in file ID, it is placed into a properly sized field, and only after everything else has been validated as being correct about our state, including that the number of pairs lines up with the length field, do we actually move the file ID bytes into that smaller buffer. This makes for a particularly tricky problem when working with a dumb fuzzer like AFL. Without knowing that there is a length field that must be accurate, even though AFL will expand the file ID field, you would also need to make the length the proper value at the same time, or the input won't do anything differently. While we're at it, let's dive into our other vulnerability a little bit. There are two distinct ways that PDF crack generates attempted passwords, either by using a generative model, which just randomly creates passwords, or by going through a pre-created dictionary word list. If we're in that word list mode, the application allocates a buffer of size bytes, then copies the rest of the line into that buffer. Like we said before, this is a fairly straightforward example of a heap buffer overflow, and is almost the canonical example for them. Our attempts to exploit this, however, were made much more difficult by how the application actually used the heap, meaning that even when we had control over the entire state variable, we were still stuck looking for interesting things to do when we found that other vulnerability. It's important to point out here that this is likely still an exploitable vulnerability, although it's one that probably requires quite a bit of work. We did not give up on it due to deciding that it was a non-exploitable vulnerability. Rather, we gave up on it because we found one that was much easier to exploit. If this was interesting to you, definitely take a look at some of the stream recordings. I glossed over a lot of details in this video about what actually went into finding these vulnerabilities. There were numerous wrong turns and false starts that went into finally creating a working exploit, and they're all recorded in gory detail in the stream recordings. Additionally, the current schedule is to do live streams Mondays at 7 p.m. and Wednesdays at 4 p.m., both times Eastern, and we're currently looking at old-school Windows 95 vulnerabilities in these streams. And if you like videos like this, please make sure to subscribe and follow me on Twitter for all sorts of future information. Thanks again everyone for watching, and hopefully you enjoy this new format of videos. Bye!